Hey Kings Mountain, today we're going to go over the 5.2 Ocean Food Webs and you're going to find this on page 7 of your packet. Before we begin with the notes, I just wanted to go over this picture just a little bit. This is a picture of how sonar works. Um, this is one of your vocab words on the first list in the Oceans packet. And sonar stands for sound, navigation, and raging. So as you can see, um, this ship is sending down um, sound waves um, out of the device, the sonar, and it is recording using sound waves how far down the ocean bottom is. And then it's sending those waves back to the ship so that it can record how or what um, is down there. Now this can also be used for fishing. So some boats um, that are specifically fishermen boats or um, you know they're doing some sort of crabbing or whatever, they might send sonar down to see if there's a school of fish in the area um, so that they can throw out their anchor and begin fishing. Um, so it would locate lots of fish, it would locate the bottom of the ocean to see how you know far down it is, that kind of thing. So very useful tool for um, captains of boats there. All right, so on your notes you have some ocean zones that you need to know about and we your, your teacher may have mentioned this previous um, because um, we have gone over the vocabulary for the continental shelf and the continental slope already. So those have to do with the zones that we're talking about. So the first zone we're going to talk about is called the intertidal zone. Um, so you see in that word there is the word tidal. So you should be thinking tides. It It is from the highest high tide to the lowest low tide. So you know, this picture is showing a beach, and so this is where the tides are going to be coming in on the beach. So if you've ever been to the beach, there's a time when there's a high tide, and there's a time when there's a low tide, and you can some, sometimes see where um, the tide had been when you walk along the beach. So this is the area where the tides are coming in. Um, if we're in North Carolina, it is a beachy shore usually, um, but if we're in the, the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle or Oregon, we might encounter a rocky shore. And so in the next couple uh, notes pages, you'll learn a little bit more about what that might look like um, if it's not a beach. Um, but you want, even if it's not a beach, if it's a rocky shore, the tides are still going to come in on those rocks. And so this is going to be considered the um, intertidal zone. All right, the neuritic zone starts where the intertidal zone leaves out. So if you can see my cursor there. So the lowest low tide out all the way to the edge of the continental shelf. Um, and you know, some some continents this goes out for, you know, the continental shelf goes out for 50 or so miles. So it's farther than you can really see. So this might look shallow in this diagram here, but it's really not. This is this gets gradually deeper and then it has a you know, large decline here, and then we are into the open ocean. And so that's the continental shelf outward, so the open ocean zone. And that zone is broken up into three zones, the surface zone, the transition zone, and the deep zone. And Miss Owens mentioned this in the 4.1 video that, you know, at the surface of the ocean, we have a lot of light coming in. Um, and then we go deeper into the ocean. We have some light, but not very much. And then in the deep zone, you're going to have hardly any light at all. Okay. Um, and so she talked about how cold it would be down at the deep, dark ocean, um, how much pressure there would be, that kind of thing. Um, so using your stems, the surface zone would be a photic zone, photo mean light, um, deep zone would be aphotic, so no light in that zone. And we're going to talk a little bit about some different organisms that live in these different um, zones in the next couple notes. 
So because of how deep these zones are and where they're at, some organisms live in the neuritic zone typically, some may live in the open ocean zone. So you'll hear about that in the next couple notes. So three general groups of life in the ocean that are classifi classified um, for you are called plankton. So these are usually tiny algae that float um, near the surface of the ocean. So in this diagram here, plankton is yellow. And so you see we have diatoms and copepods. And plankton can be um, phytoplankton, which are autotrophs, so they make their own food, um, or they can be zooplankton, Z-O-O -O plankton, um, zoo meaning animal. So they could be more animal-like, and meaning that they need to consume their food. Food, and you'll see that on the next, the next uh, food web chart on the next slide. Nectin are free swimming animals that move through the water column. So in this diagram, those are marked orange, and you'll see that there are different kinds of fish, stingrays, jellyfish, uh, dolphins, sardines. Um, so anything that moves through the water column. Well, now when they say water column, if you see that on your EOG or a benchmark, what they mean is you know, the water column is vertical, vertical columns, just like we have on the periodic table, right? So these organisms that move throughout the water column move, can move from the top to the bottom pretty freely. Um, and so they are swimming animals. Now you might say, well, jellyfish, I've heard that they float. Some, some young jellyfish do float. So you may see that, um, you know, doing some research that some jellyfish are floating. Usually they are the young jellyfish. Our last group of life in the ocean are benthos. And I always tell my students to remember, benthos begins with a B that's at the bottom of the ocean. So these organisms live on the ocean floor. Some move and some don't. So let's take a look in this diagram what we have. So benthos are marked red here. So you have a crab, you have eelgrass, brittle stars, sand dollars, sea pen. Um, so crabs are obviously going to move. Eelgrass is a plant, so it is going to be stationary, planted in, uh, you know, secured into the bottom of the ocean. Um, lots of organisms here. Sand dollars you may know of. Um, you may have purchased one at like a beach shop. Um, and obviously those are no longer living at that, that point. Um, and those are usually bleached as well, but normally they're this brown color. Um, octopus typically um, live near the bottom of the ocean, and so they are considered benthos, and they do move. So just keep in mind that some of our organisms move in at the bottom, and some of them don't. And some might kind of crawl as opposed to swim, right? So um, different kinds of movement there. All right, on to our ocean food web. Um, and this is just a review. Um, so we've studied food webs before. So this shows all the feeding relationships in a habitat. It is multiple food chains kind of put together, right? Producers make their own food. Um, an example in the ocean is photosynthetic plankton. Again, those are called phytoplankton, and you'll see them in this diagram being called algae plankton because we know algae is a plant, right? And so um, the algae um, makes its own food from sunlight. And then we have consumers that we've studied before. They don't make their own food. Um, they eat other organisms. So this animal plankton, this zooplankton, it is going to consume the algae plankton or the phytoplankton. And then you have lots of different kind of fish. Typically those are consumers. Um, 
We have the beluga whale here, which is a consumer. Um, the ringed seal is a consumer. And then we have some terrestrial animals that are interacting with those ocean organisms. So you've got the arctic tern, which is a bird that's going to interact um, with the ocean organisms. You've got the polar bear, which is a terrestrial organism, which is going to eat the ring seal. And you've also got some decomposers and a lot of times those are your benthos. Those are at the bottom of the ocean and those are going to break down waste and remains of other organisms. So that's just a little review of what we already know from the ecosystems unit. And then how are terrestrial and aquatic food webs related? So remember terrestrial is going to mean land animals and they are sometimes going to eat organisms from the water like we just saw with the polar bear. Aquatic animals might eat organisms that are terrestrial, for instance. So um, that is possible as well. So some examples you can write down. A person could eat a fish. A polar bear could eat a seal. Um, those are all good examples. Here we've got an example of a food chain. So you've got the secondary consumer, Tyrannosaurus rex, um, eating the um, primary consumer, the Triceratops. Um, right, they're going to compete for land and space. And then the Triceratops is an herbivore. It's going to it's going to eat that producer. On this food chain here, this is strictly a terrestrial food web, and this is strictly a ocean food web. So on either side of these, these are not interacting, right? Um, but at some point, maybe we have some sort of bird that is going to eat a fish, for instance. And so that would be a terrestrial food web interacting with an ocean food web or an aquatic food web. All right, so make sure you have that all down. I'm gonna backtrack to our diagram here. Um, at the bottom of your page seven, you do need to write in these different zones. So intertidal zone, neuritic zone, and then you've got the open ocean zone, which is made up of three different zones there. So write those in before you close out the video. And in the next couple notes, again, like I said, you're going to find out what kind of organisms live in these di different zones. All right, have a good day.